Hey everyone, today I'll be talking about a stock that I've followed for the last few years and it's it's an exciting stock. Um, the stock is IMAX. I, I'm a big movie goer and so naturally I was drawn to this stock and I do enjoy seeing uh, blockbusters on the big IMAX screen. Um, so I first, you know, was introduced to this stock. Uh, I think I saw a, a report on Morningstar and uh, the thesis was quite compelling. Um, this isn't your average movie theater stock. Uh, they are more of a, I would say, a technology and licensing company where they have their technology as far as visual and audio technology to enhance movies and create a better experience for moviegoers than the typical theater movie screen, right? And they will sell these systems, these IMAX systems, or lease them to movie theaters. And in some cases, they'll do a hybrid model where they will take uh, a percentage of the box office receipts in exchange for uh, a lower price for the system, right? And then they also have another side of the business, which is actually the more lucrative side, their network side of the business, where they will be they, they will receive revenue from movie studios to enhance their uh, films with IMAX technology to be to be able to uh, to make those films compatible with the IMAX system, and they even have IMAX special IMAX cameras and stuff that studios will use, and so they'll get paid on both the movie studio and the exhibitor end. So. Um, I just want to talk about kind of the story going through the Q1 presentation that uh, was posted on their investor relations website. Now you can see, uh, and, and it's no surprise that that the pandemic has drastically reduced their revenues, right? With movie theaters closing, with production, movie production grinding to a halt, they're uh, definitely going to see a big hit on revenues and therefore they will, they will see some losses. But a nice thing here um, I'd like to point out that the management would like you also to know is that they've got a strong balance sheet. So traditionally this has been a company that has had really no debt. But in Q1 they drew down a $300 million revolver. Think of that as a you know kind of taking a cash advance on a credit card just so that they have the cash and the liquidity there because they, they don't have visibility into how this is going to play out when movie theaters are going to open again. So they wanted that nice cash cushion to tide them over, right? And they estimate that currently they're burning about $10 million in cash per month, which is not bad. So if you look at this $300 million, that would last them for 30 months. And if you look at their balance sheet, they actually have... 350 million in cash on the balance sheet. So they've got, you know, almost three years worth. If, if, if the movie theater uh, theaters didn't open for three years, they actually would be able to survive without having to file for bankruptcy, right? So um, I, I, th I think we could take bankruptcy off the table for this company. So um, it's kind of a non-discussion. And, and they, ha they do have a flexible asset light business model which which is is kind of related to the low cash burn, <clears throat> and so they they think that once once uh, things open up, they'll be primed to kind of spring back and maybe even spring back stronger because of the pent up demand. So here you can see um, the Q1 numbers in this column of 2020 versus 2019, right? Drastic reduction in revenue been chopped more than in half and you can see the global box office which their revenues are closely tied to dropped off drastically but you can see actually the number of total movie theaters with IMAX systems in them increased and that's growing uh, we'll talk about in a second how they have a huge backlog so there, there definitely is demand there there's plenty of work they've got about a little over 500 theaters that they need to, to fit out still with their system. So that's future kind of revenue that they can't book yet, but it's it's there contractually once they deliver on the system. So you see they've, they've got losses here, but I would 
look past that. I mean, this is definitely atypical and should be not viewed as a going forward state of the world for IMAX. So um, <clears throat> we won't go over this. You can download this PowerPoint presentation for uh, from, from their investor relations website if you want to look at it further. So you can see here they are geographically dispersed, so there's not a ton of concentration. The biggest concentration they have is probably in China. I think they have 700 plus theaters in China alone. So China, in particular Asia in general, is a very important uh, area for them. Second is probably North America and then Europe, right? But you've got some other growing areas as well. But the key is that 73% are located internationally. Interestingly, they point out that they believe that the um, movie theater, you know, exhibition business, the box office, is somewhat recession resistant, as they point out. And, you know, 2009, the box office was up 10%. 2001 is up 8%. 2002, you know, that those recession periods. And um, I guess it makes sense. It's They're saying it's an inexpensive out-of-home entertainment compared to a lot of other things, which I agree. Uh, you know, I think people will always need to get out of the house. I know, personally, I go crazy <laughs> after a while, right, being at home. So that's kind of what they're saying here is there's pent-up demand for out-of-home entertainment, and it's likely that movies are going to still be an important part of that out-of-home entertainment. You know, just think about teenagers, and, you know, you don't have a place to go. You go to the movie theater. That's what I did when I was a teenager. I don't think that has changed drastically. Um, now, I, I, you know, I think there's a little bit of a um, kind of a bump from Netflixes of the world and the streaming and all that, but uh, I think... People still like the experience of going out, getting dinner, going to a movie, uh, just getting out of the house, right? <clears throat> and the other thing I'll point out is they're saying that um, one thing that could come out of this is maybe movie studios produce less uh, films every year, and they go for more of the blockbuster films. This has kind of been the Disney model for the last several years, and it's worked out well, right? Uh, but that would so that would hurt your traditional exhibitors like Cinemark, like AMC. But for IMAX, it might actually be a good thing because there'd be even more movies that um, are are going to IMAX screens and pushing demand for more IMAX screens and you know a bigger overall network for IMAX. And you can see that they're saying also we're probably going to have a big concentration of blockbuster films and. And so maybe increased IMAX revenue coming up because um, everything's been pushed back. So you can see here all of these movies got pushed to the second half of 2020, which are some, some big ones. And then you can see 2021's looking to be another blockbuster year, pretty much every month of the year having some big movie. Right, you can see a lot of those that you would recognize, a lot of those blockbuster sequels, and so that that's all I wanted to share, um, story-wise. And now I'd like to go through the numbers, right? So we just talked about the narrative, now I want to go through the numbers and show you uh, my valuation of IMAX. Okay, so what I've got here is Finbox.io. This uh, is a website that I've been showing. Uh, the last few videos. It's a service I subscribe to. It's uh, reasonably reasonably priced. Um, the guys do a good job. They're constantly improving it. My favorite model, they have various models that you can use. My favorite model, just the way that I've been trained, is to do a DCF with a growth exit. So it's like a terminal value DCF. So you can see here a summary of my numbers actually I think um, I'm just gonna make sure I've got the right numbers here yeah okay and I actually brought the value down from what Finbox had uh, by a little bit because I, I adjusted my margins I wasn't as um, confident in the margins I think they were going up to 40% EBITDA margins eventually I'm going only up to 35 historically they've done around 30 
you can see 2019 they've done 31. So I think as they grow, um, they start to get some uh, scale and uh, cover their fixed expenses, right? And so more drops to the bottom line. So that operating leverage starts to kick in. So you can see how the revenue is assumed to drop drastically in 2020 by more than half with a rebound in 2021, right? And then we, we just start chugging along you know, for a few years before we kind of hit hit that point where we're just growing at the uh, rate of the economy, right? This is uh, this this two percent a year in the back half of this ten year forecast. So now let me show you um, the calculation of free cash flows down here. So based on our our EBITDA number and adding back uh, the our assumed depreciation, subtracting out capex and um, networking capital um, investment, we actually get a benefit. So oftentimes when your revenue drops, right, your, your networking capital requirements go down. So actually it's cash positive, but then when you when you get back into gear and are, are um, you have to kind of spend money, so your networking capital investment is negative, so it takes cash. Mm -hmm. Um, but you can see what, what's important is not these early years. It's kind of bouncing around here the first few years. But what we basically get to is a run rate of over 100 million, right? It's really actually approaching 130 million. You can see in the terminal year, we're, we're assuming 130 million of free cash flow that this company is, is generating, right? So just keep that in the back of your mind. You know, what is a company that generates 130 million of free cash flow worth? Well, if we go here to the calculation of the enterprise value, so this, we're calculating the value of the entire firm, not just the equity portion, but the, the full, you know, kind of if, if this was a house, the, the value of the entire house, not just your equity portion of the house, right? Because there can be debt and equity holders in a company just like there is in a, in a house. Um, so for the firm, we're calculating after we discount these cash flows over the next 10 years back to present, at the, at the we had three different discount rates, so we're we'll just go with the middle one, which I think was above 10%. 655 million is the value of the, the next 10 years of cash flows, and then the uh, value of the cash flows after that 10 years, based on some math, we're, we're assuming is 597. So you add this and this to get 1.2 billion as the value of the enterprise which is going to be, I think, close to the value of equity in this case because the amount of debt and the amount of cash they have kind of cancel out. So you can see here when we're calculating the equity portion, um, start with the enterprise value, you add it, the cash that's on the books minus the debt, we've got some other liabilities, you end up with the value of equity at $1.2 billion. When there's 59 million shares outstanding, that gets you a share price of about a little over $20 a share, right? And um, currently, if we go back here, stock's trading at less than 13. So there's more than 60% upside if it gets back to fair value. Uh, if you look were to look back at a chart, I won't bring it up now, but you can see that prior to COVID, that's where it was trading around 20 bucks a share, right? So I think it does get back there, probably take a, a year um, as things are looking up and up, but it could be, it could happen faster. Don't underestimate the ability of the market to pre-price things in the future. Ken Fisher, who I follow, uh, who I think is one of the best macro guys out there, he always says three and 30, the market is pricing anywhere between three and 30 months into the future, right? So if, 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 if the market starts looking at IMAX, uh, the, the, the state of the world for IMAX in 2021 or 2022, which could happen sooner than later. I think we get back to 20 really quick. Anyway, I hope you like this video. Uh, please subscribe if you want to see more videos like it. And um, also hit the bell to get alerts for when my videos come out. I try to do this, you know, a couple times a month so that um, mostly as, as ideas come up, right? I'm not, I'm not beholden to any sort of schedule because I, I don't like to present ideas that I don't really believe in. And just full disclosure, I, I have a, a long position in, in IMAX. All right. Thank you.